This evening we're looking at uh, Malachi. Uh, if you want to uh, turn that up in your Bibles, you'll find it the last book of the Old Testament. And I think it's uh, interesting what the Lord actually says through the prophet Malachi to his people in this particular text because, as you probably are aware, this being the last book that was written in the Old Testament means that there was 400 years in which there was no prophetic utterance, there was no message from God, there was just silence until that silence was broken by John the Baptist, at least publicly. It was broken um, more personally by um, the angel Gabriel as he came and told Zacharias that his wife Elizabeth was going to bear a son. And then as he goes, of course, to uh, Mary to let her know that, he, that she's going to be bearing uh, the Messiah. Actually, uh, yes, and also to Joseph to let him know that it was not uh, immorality on her part. But this is really the last thing that the Lord told his people uh, before the silence. So let's read just a few verses of Malachi. We're going to read uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And here I think you'll find a very familiar passage and one upon which I believe a portion of the Messiah, written by Handel, is based on. Malachi 3, verse 1 through verse 6. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years." Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now, as I've said, we come to the final attribute of God that we're going to be considering as a reason why we should love God. And that is what we call God's immutability, the fact that he does not change. Now, again, I think we need to realize that if the Lord had all the attributes that we've already seen, but all of that could change, or any of that could change in a moment, could change perhaps in a year or 10 years or in a million years, if he could ever become other than what he is, then we could only be afraid of what it is that he could become and really would not be able genuinely to love him. Remember this, that if the Lord had all the power that he has, all the knowledge, all the presence, remember he is everywhere at once, but did not have love, that he would be the greatest monster that could ever exist, the greatest monster that could be conceived. If his love could change, if any part of him, well actually if his love could change, that would be a, a real possibility. And certainly if God's natural attributes of power could change, or even if his knowledge could change so that suddenly he became ignorant, he would not be able to guarantee his promises toward us. This evening, we're going to consider the fact that God is immutable. And we're going to see first that he never changes. And secondly, we want to see why this should not only bring us a great deal of comfort, but why it also gives us the greatest reason to love him. So first of all, let's consider that God never changes. Now, in our passage the Lord is promising through Malachi the prophet to send his messenger to prepare the way for the Lord. And when the Lord came, 
He was going to purify his people. Of course, the reason why he was going to do that was because they had fallen into a great deal of sin by that time. When Jesus appears on the scene, it's pictured as a light rising in the darkness. And that darkness was not physical darkness, but moral darkness. When the Lord came, he would purify his people. He would remove the dross of the land. That would be the wicked and the unrepentant. And he would cleanse his people of their sins so that they might again present their offerings in righteousness. I think you understand that that messenger was John the Baptist, the one who would prepare the way for the Lord of the covenant to get the people ready by preaching the uh, message of repentance. And the Lord who was coming was certainly the Lord, Yahweh, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who in his ministry was said to gather his wheat from the threshing floor, to gather it into his barn, and then to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, he was going to remove the dross and purify, as it were, the sons of Levi, to purify them that they might again offer sacrifices in righteousness. In other words, purify his people. But he was also going to bring judgment. He was going to burn up the chaff. He did bring judgment on the Jews that rejected him in 70 AD, as well as eternal judgment on those that never repented of their sins, particularly that sin of condemning him and crucifying him. Now the Lord, as he, as he tells them what he's going to do, again before this 400 years of silence, said that he would do this and that he would not fail because he never changes. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. It's interesting that he says that just after he talks about the judgment that he's going to bring. But there's judgment and there is mercy. Judgment upon the unrepentant, those who are not the true sons of Jacob or the true sons of Abraham, but rather mercy upon those who are, upon the true sons of Jacob, the ones who truly trust in the Lord. And what a great message to give before this time of silence that God is going to fulfill what he said he is going to do. And he's going to do that because he never changes. Because he cannot change. God never changes. Now that's true of the entirety of God. That's true of, uh, of his being. It's true of his purposes. It's true of his character. First of all, the being of God can never change. And really, I suppose in a certain sense that would include everything about God, but I'm thinking mainly about his natural attributes, his natural attributes of power and presence, eternality and knowledge. He can never change. He can never become something other than what he already is. God cannot become more powerful because he's infinitely powerful. He cannot become less powerful. He will always be infinite. He cannot be more or less eternal, more or less present, more or less knowledgeable. God is infinite and will always be infinite. It's interesting, too, when you think about it. When God spoke and the universe came into existence, by the way, if you, if you, um, you know, think of the universe as if, if you just don't know anything more of it than just simply going outside and looking at what you can see of the starry heavens, uh, you're not going to think God is that great. But if you go to an observatory and you look at the pictures that have been taken out in space and the billions of galaxies that are out there that they believe are just as large as the one that we're in, which is vast, that God spoke all of that into existence with just a word and after he had done it, he was no less powerful, no less, you know, he had no less power than he did when he began. There wasn't the slightest fluctuation in his power. And even though he brought all of this into existence, there wasn't the least limiting of God's presence. And as thousands of years have passed after his creation, and his plan has been continually unfolding in the lives of billions of people, God has not learned anything new, anything that he didn't already know. God has not changed in the slightest. There's really no force in heaven or on earth that is powerful enough to make the slightest change in him, and nothing that he does changes him in the slightest. 
He is and must be forever the same. His being cannot change. Secondly, the fact that God never changes also means that his purpose or his plan can never change. That God cannot repent. He cannot repent of anything that he has ever said, especially those things, of course, that he said that he would do. Again, look at our meditation. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? You see, God cannot but do what he has said because God cannot repent. In order for him to repent or to change his mind about anything, there would have had to have been something that he was unaware of when he actually first purposed or promised to do that thing. There must have been something that could have taken God by surprise, something that would have made him change his mind. But the fact is, God knows everything. The reason why he does is because he knows what he has chosen to do. Everything that really comes about in this world comes about through the absolute sovereignty of God. Everything that he allows to happen has come about by his choice. He knows everything that's going to happen. And knowing not only everything that is going to happen, but everything that could happen under any given set of circumstances, he already has made the best possible choices that could be made. So there's no reason to repent of any of those things, no reason to go back because God has already made the best choices. Now, I should mention this, that in Scripture, sometimes God represents himself as changing his mind, even in a certain sense, repenting. Such as in Noah's day, when he saw all the wickedness of man, that the, every intent of his, of his heart was only evil continually. God said he was sorry that he made man. Now, what you need to understand is that this doesn't really mean that he's changed his mind because if it did, then God would be directly contradicting himself and that's something that he could never do. God cannot lie and he says he never changes his mind and he never repents. So how are we to understand passages like that? Well, the Lord was simply saying in the days of Noah that though he made man knowing what would happen with man and knowing that he would do things that would be so dishonoring to God, God also knew when that happened that he would be very displeased with man and that he would say that he was displeased with him. But he hasn't really changed his mind because what happened in those days is exactly what God purposed to take place. And let me just mention this also that when God uses evil again for his purposes or if, if this was his will that these evil things take place and that man fall into that situation that he did, doesn't mean that God created the evil, doesn't mean that he forced man to do evil. We know that evil entered into the world through Satan and Satan certainly tempted man and caused him to fall into evil. God simply uses that evil that exists through his creatures in order to bring about his good purposes. So even though that was his will, he didn't force them to sin, but rather chose to use that evil to bring about good purposes. And he has always overruled evil for good purposes, which is, again, why it doesn't really matter what happens in the world. It's not outside of God's control, and he will work it together for good. But again, the fact that God's character cannot change, his purposes uh, cannot change. I mean, God never changes, and so he will never repent or change his mind. Now, thirdly, we need to look at the fact that there is something, well, not only God's being, and not only what he has purposed to do or his will is not going to change, but his moral character is never going to change. God is always going to be holy. He cannot become more or less holy. He cannot become more or less loving. Remember that holiness is love. The love for what is good and the love for what is right. He cannot become more or less of that that he already is. He cannot become more or less merciful, more or less gracious, 
more or less patient and kind and benevolent or just. By the way, I, I, as I was thinking about this, I'm, I'm just reminded that there are so many Christians today who believe that God has radically changed from the Old Testament to the New. I don't know if you've ever thought that way. It seems like well, there are a lot of judgments in the Old Testament, but there doesn't seem to be quite so many in the New Testament. seems like uh, there was, I don't know, there's more law in the Old Testament and more grace in the New Testament. One thing you need to understand is that that's the same God. Uh, he is simply revealing uh, more grace in the new covenant, to be sure. But he hasn't changed. His love for what is good and right has not changed. His purpose to judge evil has not changed. As a matter of fact, someday God is going to destroy the world. And he's going to destroy the wicked. That hasn't changed. If you read the New Testament to be in, you know, to, to have, as it were, a, a God whose character is different from the Old Testament, you're not understanding who God is. So that's one thing we need to guard against. God never changes. I mean, that's the whole point of what we're looking at this evening. He never changes. It's the same God with exactly the same purpose. It's just that we are seeing more of this particular characteristic of God. And at the same time, the Bible reminds us that his purpose to judge evil is still there. It's the reason why his, his wrath is being revealed from heaven every day against the unrighteousness and wickedness of men, as Paul tells us in Romans 1, or why Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead on the spot for lying to the Holy Spirit. God has not changed. We just, again, understand that God is, is certainly being or showing more of that grace, which he certainly showed his people in the Old Testament. Now, the fact that God doesn't change, of course, means that he's not going to change toward you. And this is where we move into that second point with regard to why the fact God never changes should be a reason for you to love him. One thing I should mention about this to begin with is certainly the fact that God's love is eternal. Now let me begin with this because um, the fact that God never changes really becomes the premier reason why you can, why you should love him and why you um, will always be able to love him. First of all, you need to realize that uh, what you love about God or what you should love about him, most of all as a Christian, is never going to change. And what is it that as a Christian you can and should love God most for? It's his holiness. Remember, his holiness or his love for what is good and right is the only thing that makes God lovely. Without that, God would be a monster. It's really what makes him, uh, as I've said before, lovely to begin with. His holiness, his perfect love for what is good and what is right is never going to change. And so that which you love about God, you will always be able to love about him throughout eternity and you will never grow tired of loving him. So the fact that God doesn't change means that you will always have a reason to love him. That which you love about him won't change. But secondly, it also means that his love for you isn't going to change. That's very encouraging and very comforting. His purpose to redeem you, his purpose to keep you, his purpose to love you is never going to change. His love towards you that basically moved him to send his son into the world to live for you and to die for you. His purpose to place you in his son and to give you his righteousness is never going to change. You know, God's love for you is eternal. This is one thing that we looked at, I believe, um, and I can't remember the exact context, but the Bible says that those whom he foreloved, in Romans chapter 8, he predestined to adoption of sons. That that foreknowledge is not just foreknowing what you would do, but it was foreknowing you and foreloving you, which means that God's love for you is eternal. That's not a decision that God made in eternity to begin to love you. He had you in his mind from all eternity. You are an eternal thought in the mind of God 
and he loved you from all eternity. One thing that uh, Dick Nielsen used to say, just about in every prayer as we would pray uh, in, the, uh, uh, you know, in the office before the meeting, was the fact that thanking God that God's love for us will never come to an end because it had no beginning. And I'm not sure exactly where he came into contact with that thought, but it's absolutely true. God, if God loves you and that love is expressed to you by granting you the grace that you need to trust in Jesus, if you are in Jesus Christ, God loves you now. If he loves you now, that means that he has always loved you. And if he has always loved you in eternity, that means that he will always love you. God's love for you is eternal. And that should be a tremendous comfort because that love is not going to change. It will always be there because he never changes. His purpose for you is never going to change. I mean, he purposed out of his love to send his son and to put you in Jesus Christ, and you will forever be in Jesus Christ. If you understand what that means, it simply means that God counts you as his son. I mean, he has given you his righteousness. He's given you his, his, his uh, well, everything that Jesus Christ has, has purchased through his work. You are in Christ. You are counted as being one with Christ, and the Lord counts you as righteous. He counts you as never having done anything wrong, but everything right and worthy of heaven. You are justified by his righteousness. You are actually made beautiful in the eyes of God through the merits of his son. That purpose that our Lord has had because of his infinite love towards you to put you in his son will never change. So you will always be in Christ, which means that his purpose for loving you or his reason to love you, which is Jesus Christ, will never change. So his love that singled you out from all eternity is going to be consummated to all eternity. And you know what? The, the, um, the real encouraging thing about this as well is this, that God chose you, he loved you, he chose to put you in his son, that's never going to change, and he did that knowing not only the sins you would commit before you came to Christ, but also the sins you would commit after you came to Christ. He knew all of those things when he saved you, and yet he still saved you. There's nothing that you can do that can take God by surprise. God is not going to change in his purposes toward you. Again, just as his whole plan can't change because nothing can take him by surprise, his plan for you as individuals is not going to change because you can't do anything that will surprise him. When God chose to bring you into his kingdom and make you a son and a daughter, that was something he purposed to do forever, and he's never going to turn back from it. So the fact that God doesn't change means that his character isn't going to change, his holiness won't change, so that you can love him throughout eternity. His love for you is never going to change. But one more comforting thing about this with regard to the fact that God's being never changes means that his ability to keep you is never going to change. God has infinite and eternal power at his disposal not only to keep you in existence. Remember that none of us here exists by ourselves. If God was not upholding us by his power, we would all simply cease to exist. Well, God's infinite and eternal power isn't going to change, so he is going to continue to hold you up in existence. But he is also going to secure you from all danger. He has saved you, and you're safe. Because his power will never change in the slightest. You are eternally secure. So it doesn't matter how many myriads of years will pass by, those are nothing to God. They don't change him in the slightest. They don't cause his power to waver in the slightest, and so they will not affect you either. God is going to keep you safe forever, safe in his care. So because God never changes, you will live forever if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, there's also that downside. If you don't trust in Jesus Christ because God loves what is right, if you don't trust in Jesus, his purpose to judge you forever will also continue. And the fact that he continues forever means that that punishment will continue forever. So 
If that is the case with you, if you haven't trusted Jesus, trust in the Lord and turn from your sins. But again, for those of, of us who know him, the question we've been asking is simply this. Understanding what God is like, can you love God? And do you love God? Do you love him? You know, not just what he gives, but do you love him for who and what he is, particularly because he's holy? I mean, as we painted this picture of God, what would you change? What would you change about God? God is absolutely perfect in every way. And that is why we should love him. Again, particularly for his holiness. Because without it, all of those other attributes would really be a threat to us. His holiness is what makes him to be a blessing to us. Well, if you do love the Lord for his holiness, if you do love this God, then you are his. And if you are his, you are safe for all eternity. The one whom you love the most will never change. And so he will keep you safely with himself for all eternity. Now, really, the only thing left to look at in a series like this, since we've already seen that God is certainly worthy of our love, and I hope we wouldn't change anything about God, even if we could, the only thing left for you and me to think about is what our response should be. If we really do love him, you know, what, what should we do to show that love? There's really only one thing that God desires from us. And the reason why he has made us the objects of his love is that we might give this to him, and that is simply to love him in return. That's what the Lord wants us to do. And how do we show God that we love him? Well, there's really only one way to do that, and that is through our obedience. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And obviously, if you don't love him, you won't. Now, it shouldn't be that hard, considering all the love that the Lord has shown to us, to love him in return. Again, if he is infinite love, if that really is what God is, and, and he is, if you can love those who love you with, with the, you know, the, the finite love that they do, can't you love one who loves you with infinite love? The Lord has given you the same love for holiness that he himself has. You know, the, the Bible, I think it's Peter who says that we have become partakers of the divine nature. And he doesn't mean by that that, you know, that our being is the same as God's being and that we have infinite power and knowledge and eternality and so forth. That's not what Peter means. But when he talks about the divine nature, he means you have your, the spirit of God living in your, in your heart, in your soul. And he gives you the same kind of love for the things that he loves, the same love that God has. So he's given you a love for what is holy, but God is holy. So isn't your heart already inclined toward obeying him and giving him what it is that he wants? Isn't it already moving you? Isn't this love, the Holy Spirit, moving you to obedience, to love his holy law? and to submit to it. So God is infinite love. It's easy to love him in return. And he's already given you his Holy Spirit to move you towards this obedience and to show him love. It's not that hard. God has saved you from everlasting misery. I mean, in eternity that you deserved and that I deserved. And he has prepared a place in eternity for you in heaven. I mean, don't you want to serve him just on the basis of that, that he would do such wonderful things for you? Don't you want to obey him and serve him for his infinite mercies? Uh, the God who made the universe, the God of the universe, who has all power and authority, has called you to obedience. Shouldn't your sense of duty, again, thankfulness for God having made you, and certainly that which he has given you of this desire to do what is right rather than wrong, doesn't that compel you also to give to God what he desires, which is simply obedience? You know, if you are a true believer, then you will be a believer more than in just words. 
You know, it's easy to say I'm a Christian. It's easy to say I love the Lord. But if you truly love the Lord, then you will love him in your actions as well as in your words. And you will do what you do from the heart. You will love the Lord with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. You'll try to love him in the things that you think. You'll try to love him in the things that you say. And you will try to love him also in your actions. As a matter of fact, as we've already seen, if we truly love the Lord, our whole lives will be one continual act of love and devotion to him. So the point is this, that if God truly is worthy to be loved, then love him. Don't just say that you love him. And don't just tell the Lord week after week that you love him, but show him that you love him. Again, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? And if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Show the Lord that you truly do love him through a life completely devoted to him. That's really the only way that we can. By the way, we saw that, I believe, in, in Edward's religious affections. Again, there are all these evidences that we might look at to say, this is why I believe I'm a Christian. This is why I believe I'm going to heaven. But the one thing that proves that more than anything else is the fact that you're willing to do what God calls you to do because you really want to do it and because you really do love that way and you love him and you want to honor him and you want to thank him because you love him as this holy God. So may the Lord grant to each of us that we may love him in this way. It's really the only way that his kingdom is going to advance. It's the only way that, that uh, we're going to see the changes take place in our society, that we want to see change, is if we truly begin to love God the way that he calls us to love him. And by the way, you, you really can't outlove God. One thing that, um, that is going to be absolutely true, and that is as you set your heart to begin to obey God in all these different areas that you will find the sense in your own heart of God's love for you to increase more and more. And you'll sense more of his spirit, more of his love, more of his power. I think the one thing that, that the church does more than anything else that chokes off the power of God is our unwillingness to actually submit to what the Lord tells us to do. There are certain things we're willing to do but there are certain things we're not willing to do. and Maybe certain things we're not willing to give up. We've got to give up everything that's sinful. Give up the world. Give up our love of the world. And love the Lord and do all that he calls us to do. It is for our good, mainly. And it is how the kingdom of heaven will advance. But it is the way that we show him that we love him. Well, let's, uh, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to show us what's true of us. And to help us to rid from our lives all those things we do that are not loving to the Lord, that don't show him love, and ask him as well to give us the grace to put on every righteous act, to obey every one of his commandments, to show him that we truly do love him. Let's spend a few moments in prayer.